Hi guys, welcome. So today in News in 30 Minutes, we are going to discuss the important issues on the 7th of October 2023. So as I keep telling you, this initiative is not a substitute for you to read newspapers. It should complement your newspaper reading because newspapers and reading them is a very important skill as well as a prerequisite for you to clear this exam. So please develop the habit of reading newspapers and I hope this initiative will help you in sparking that interest in your newspaper reading. All right. So with that, let us look at the issues of today. The first issue is inflation shock RBI's big worry. So they keep the repo rate unchanged. This term called inflation is a very important concept, especially in your prelims exam. Many application based questions come on this inflation. So what exactly is inflation? It is a rise in the prices of goods, commodities or services. But this rise is consistent over several periods of time. It is not rise in prices for one or two days. If the rise in prices happens for prolonged periods of time, then you call that as inflation. So what happens in inflation? If I take a commodity X and let us say that you are paying rupees 100 for this commodity. Now because of inflation for the same commodity X, you may result in paying 110 rupees. So you are paying 10 rupees extra for the same product and this is known as inflation. That 10 rupees is the inflation premium that you are going to pay for the same commodity which you used to pay only 100 rupees. So this is what is inflation. So inflation erodes the value of money. It erodes the value of money. Hence it has negative consequences on the economy if there is high inflation for prolonged periods of time. For example, it can hurt our currency in depreciating the value of the currency. It can, help, uh, it can hurt the credit growth of the country. So inflation is, uh, you know, after a certain level bad for the economy. Hence, to curb this inflation, we have RBI. Now the job of RBI is twofold. One, it is to curb inflation and two is the policies for development and to focus on economic growth. So broadly, these are the two objectives of RBI. However, now to curb inflation, RBI has set up a body called Monetary Policy Committee. It's a six member committee and the chairman of it is RBI governor. This Monetary Policy Committee, the job of the Monetary Policy Committee is to set benchmarks for policy interest rates or in other words, it will set benchmarks for repo rates. That is what is the job of the monetary policy committee. All right. So that is the main job. Now, why it sets this repo rate is because the main objective of monetary policy committee is to target inflation. So it has something called 4% of inflation targeting. When I say 4% of inflation targeting, it means that the NPC, its main job is to make sure inflation will not breach the mark of 4%. It will always be somewhere near the 4% mark. Now, why is RBI worried? The reason why RBI is worried is for the fiscal year 24, the inflation has gone to 5.4%. Now the job of MPC is to make sure that the inflation stays at 4%. Already the inflation is breached to 5.4% and this is the worry. Hence RBA is keeping the repo rate fixed and it is not changing it. All right. So what is repo rate? If you can see here, repo rate is the rate of interest RBA charges from banks when the latter, that is when the banks borrow money from the central bank to make for the shortage of funds. In very simple words, repo rates are the cost of borrowing. They are the cost of borrowing of banks from RBI. That is repo rate. 
So if I increase the repo rate, the cost of borrowing of banks from RBI increases. So they will borrow less. If they borrow less, there is less money going into the economy. When there is less money going into the economy, the inflation will reduce. So repo rate, keep increasing the repo rates or keeping them unchanged is basically a measure to make sure that they curb inflation. So this is how RBI through repo rates will you know try to curb inflation. Okay, so this is the main job of the monetary policy committee. Okay, so you should have a very good idea of different instruments. You should have a different, you should have idea about the different instruments that the RBI uses in its monetary policy. So instruments can be repo rate and reverse repo rate. That is one. The second, the second is the uh, marginal standing facility. The third is bank rate. The fourth is CRR and SLR. The fifth is open market operations where they sell or purchase bonds. The sixth is market stabilization scheme. So these are some of the important instruments of RBI in order to uh, you know, influence the monetary policy of India and to influence the inflationary tendencies and the liquidity of money within the Indian economy. Okay. Now, uh, to give you a current context also, there are two types of inflation. One is headline inflation. Another is core inflation. Okay. So, in India, core inflation is decreasing, which is a good thing. However, the headline inflation is still very high. Now, what is core inflation? Core inflation is all goods, commodities and services except food and fuel. So there is no food or fuel in the basket to measure core inflation. All right. But if you take headline inflation, it involves goods, uh, goods, services and commodities inclusive of food and fuel. Okay. Now this food and fuel is playing an important role in keeping the inflation high in India. The reason is if I take food, Monsoon has been deficit, so food uh, inflation is pretty much uh, a consequence of it. And if I take fuel, the global volatility of prices of oil has created that inflationary tendencies in the fuel as well. So because of these two reasons, the headline inflation in India has been relatively high and this is a worrisome for RBI, hence the repo rate or the rate has kept has been kept unchanged by the RBI. So this is basically the uh, issue of RBI. Just one more information is the monetary policy committee, the monetary policy committee has been set up by the amendment of RBI Act 1934. All right. So with that, this issue is more or less covered. Now, the next issue, the next issue is an internal security issue. And the issue is dealing with Naxalism. Now, this is a very pertinent issue in GS3 internal security because Naxalism or left wing extremism is a question that keeps recurring every alternative year in UPSC exams. So you should have a good idea about it. So our own minister has given a statement that Naxalism will be eliminated in two years. The uh, statement is a positive statement. The own minister has also stated that Naxalism is a menace to humanity. Naxalism is a menace to humanity. However, the Home Minister has stated few facts to show the current status of Naxalism in India. The first thing that you should know is this Naxal activities. There has been a large lowest number of violent incidents in four decades this is one of the good outcome of naxalism affected districts in india there has been lowest in the entire four decades the off late has been the lowest number of violent incidents another stat the o minister tells is there has been 77 percent reduction in violent incidents compared to 2010 levels that is another positive thing, 77% reduction and lowest violent incidents in the last four decades. This is the current status of Naxalism in India. 
along with this our uh, home minister has also stated what are the steps that are being taken in order to reduce these naxalism especially in the lwe affected districts the first thing the home, uh, home minister stated was the government plans to establish 195 new central armed police force camps that is one news the second is ex gracia uh, amount for lwe victims the ex gracia amount for lwe victims is almost close to 40 lakh rupees this is a you know a soft approach to the uh, you know lwe affected districts the third is 14000 projects are being launched in the lwe districts as a part of special central assistance scheme as a part of this special central assistance scheme they have launched 14000 projects and the home minister also announced that 80% of this project is also completed that is another good news another thing that the home minister pointed out is rupees 992 crores has been dedicated for fortification of police stations for building the intelligence network as well as developing special forces and lastly the uh, uh, home minister also iterated the effective implementation of a policy and the name of the policy is the national policy and action plan to address lwe left wing extremism so this particular policy which was uh, approved in 2015 talks on two fold approach one is the security approach and the other is the development approach so both the approaches are very important and this policy focuses on uh, both the, both of these things and this effective implementation of this policy is also important is what was reiterated uh, in this particular uh, gathering so this is a few uh, steps that our home minister reiterated uh, in order to reduce the menace of naxalism in india and also he stated the lowest violence incidents in the last four decades has been now which is again a good uh, you know uh, uh, a good news for the naxalism affected areas so this is about the issue of naxalism however as you know naxalism is a very important topic in internal security of gs3 so please make sure that you have a good background as well as the consequences and the you know current status of naxalism in india current status have given you a very good picture just have a make sure that you have a good background on this so this is about this issue the next issue is about poxo act so poxo act is basically protection of children against sexual offences act now in this poxo act the age of consensual sex is 18 years so if any child is below 18 years and if there is a consensual sex even that sex is criminalized under poxo act so this is the uh, regulation or a provision in poxo act now what happens is unicef comes out with a policy brief the name of that policy brief is implications of the poxo act implications of the poxo act in india on adolescent sexuality okay so it comes up with this policy brief and in this policy policy brief they say that the age of consensual sex must be 16 years the age should be 16 years so this is one of the policy brief given by unicef now to argue against this we have a body called national commission on protection of child rights this body very vehemently argued against this particular policy brief of unicef and they successfully 
even gave uh, reasons for the UNICEF to withdraw this policy brief. What were the reasons given by our National Commission on Protection of Child Rights? One, they said there is no international law that defines the age of consensual sex. There is no international law at all. That is the first thing. The second thing, what they told is, if you take trafficking, even in trafficking, the age of consent is decided as 18 years. Anything below that, there is no age of consent. It is considered trafficking and this is recognized by United Nations Convention on Rights of Children. When you have the age fixed as 18 years for the consent for trafficking, then why is it that for sexual activities you are lowering the bar? This is another argument. The third argument is WHO has iterated again and again whenever the early initiation happens of sexual activities. Whenever there is early initiation of sexual activities, this will always result in unwanted pregnancies, unsafe abortion, as well as sexually transmitted diseases. So unsafe pregnancies, unwarranted or unsafe abortions, as well as sexually transmitted diseases. These are some of the consequences of early initiation of sexual activities. The fourth reason that the NC uh, PCR gave was if you keep the consensual age low, too low, then this may result in child undergoing exploitation. So overall, these were the reasons that the NC PCR was able to successfully give to UNICEF that resulted in the withdrawal of the policy brief, which spoke of reducing the age of consensus. So our POXO Act has been strong as ever and has been a very successful uh, legislation and it has successfully withstood this criticism from UNICEF. So you should know about this body of UNICEF, you should know about the NCPCR as well as you should know uh, the, uh, the, the provisions, important provisions of our POXO Act. So this is the main issue that is running with respect to POXO. All right. The next issue is deficit monsoon could hit India's depleting food stock. See, what happens is India is a monsoon dependent country. Okay. So whenever the monsoon is deficit, it results in affecting agriculture. And when agriculture is affected, that results in affecting food production that will result in food inflation. This is the problem. Whenever the monsoon is deficit, it will automatically result in food inflation. All right. So first, uh, that is what is happening. Now, this article tells why is there monsoon deficit in India? Okay. Now, the article tells that the one reason for monsoon deficit is El Nino. And the second reason is the cyclone called Bipur Joy in Arabian Sea. Not Bay of Bengal, it is in Arabian Sea. So whenever there is El Nino, monsoon is affected. That is the first reason. The second is this cyclone that was there in Arabian Sea, it affected the pressure gradient in the, in the you know, Arabian Sea. And it weakened the southwest monsoons going into the Indian landmass. And because of the weakening of the southwest monsoons going into Indian landmass, it affected our monsoons. So these are the two main reasons for you know the monsoon deficit currently. To just give you a background of what monsoons is, monsoon is nothing but seasonal reversal of winds. So whenever you call any region as a monsoon region, monsoon region means there has to be one seasonal reversal of winds, two orographic type of rainfall, three the vegetation should be deciduous vegetation, four 90 percent of the rainfall should be confined to only four months. So when these four characteristics are resolved then you call that region as monsoon region. And the next is El Nino. What is El Nino? El Nino is warming up of eastern central pacific ocean and it results in the reversal of walker circulation and the reversal of walker circulation is known as ENSO. Okay. Now, what is the relation between monsoons and El Nino? Now, this is what let us discuss. Okay. If you look at this diagram now, 
This diagram shows the correlation of El Nino and monsoons. Now, if you see, I have taken 16 years. There is 16 years of data of El Nino. And amongst the 16 years of El Nino from 1951 to 2023, okay, these 16 years of El Nino, El Nino 16 years, 10 El Nino years has resulted in deficit of monsoons, 6 El Nino years there has been normal monsoons. So one thing you should know is El Nino influences monsoons, but whenever there is an El Nino, it will not result in deficit of monsoons. As you can see in the 16 El Nino years, 10 has resulted in the deficit, 6 as there has been normal monsoons. So El Nino influences monsoons, but not every time. However, this time there has been uh, El Nino in the Central East Pacific Ocean and this has definitely resulted in the deficit of monsoons in India. So this is about the deficit monsoons that has hit the India's depleting food stock. So I hope you understood this. The next uh, topic is a very very beautifully written article which you know not only will tell you the importance of national educational policy 2020 it will also make you revise the entire sustainable development goals that is how the beauty of this article is before getting into this what is sdgs okay sustainable development goals of united nations so it is nothing but a set of 17 goals these 17 goals are divided as 169 targets and these targets are given to 193 member states and they have been given the time frame to achieve this by the end of 2030. So this is what is sustainable development goals. Okay. Now the author says our national educational policy 2020 is very highly tuned to SDG. The reason why the author tells that our national education policy is tuned to SDG is one the educational policy commits higher educational institutions to map day-to-day -day activities on achieving SDGs. That is a very important and a very radical thinking. It commits higher educational institutions to map day-to-day -day activities to achieve SDGs. The second is the national educational policy ranks universities on the basis of the achievement of SDGs. So this is why the author of this article says that NEP is very much in tune in resolving or in achieving our SDGs by 2030. This is uh, the introductory part. Then now the author also says the importance of higher education in any country. The author says higher education is important in any country because of the following reasons. One because of the social mobility. It accelerates social mobility. The second is it empowers women. The third is it provides employment. The fourth is it triggers creativity and critical thinking. So if this is if these four things are a consequence of higher education, especially in India where there is demographic that is very young, this has very huge positive consequences. That is what the author says. All right. Now, the author also says how higher education can help solve SDGs. Very beautifully, the author says by giving three points. One, the author says by establishing all inclusive university. By establishing all inclusive university, we are able to solve the SDG of 1, 2, 3, 5, 8 and 10. Now just before I uh, get into this, you should know that SDG 4 is access to quality education. That is what is SDG 4. Sorry. SDG 4 okay so now by providing all inclusive university the author argues that we can get rid of poverty we can get rid of hunger we can get gender equality we can get decent work we can get economic growth and we can reduce inequalities 
See, by establishing all inclusive universities, we can solve SDG 1, 2, 3, 5, 8 and 10. That is what the author tells. Next, the author says, by setting up multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary systems, by setting up multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary system, we can solve the SDG of 7, 11 and 13. 7 is by having multidisciplinary systems, we can develop solutions for affordable and clean energy. By having multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary systems, we can have sustainable cities and communities not only cities remember that communities are also there the 13th uh, SDG is by having such systems we can develop our mitigation strategies for climate change and global warming okay so the second way of dealing with uh, the SDG 7 11 and 13 is multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary systems in higher education the third the author says is developing value-based education by developing value-based education you can solve the stg of 9 and 12. the 9 is about innovative solutions innovative solutions are required because you have to conserve as well as you have to develop conservation and development balancing both requires innovation the next is sdg 12 that is the way we consume if we have to consume optimally, if we have to consume ethically and not over exploit, then we have to be, uh, you know, value based education plays an important role in sustainable consumption. So this is a beautiful article wherein by having SDG 4, this SDG 4 will have an impact on 1, 2, 3, 5, 8 and 10 if the all inclusive universities are encouraged. This SDG 4 will have an impact on 7, 11 and 13 if multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary systems are encouraged. And SDG 4 will also help in 9 and 12 if value-based education are encouraged. So this is a very beautiful article. Read about it. Learn SDGs so that you can use it in your mains paper especially and it can also help you in your prelims exam. However, this article talks about the importance of higher education as well as how NEP has been in tune with the sustainable development goals of United Nations. So I hope it was helpful. The next and the last issue of today is Russia signals that it will step back from the nuclear test treaty. Okay. So to give you a background of what they are talking about is they are talking about something called comprehensive nuclear Test Ban Treaty 1996. Okay, so what is the objective of this? This the objective of this is to ban nuclear explosions, both military as well as civilian purposes. So you should understand this. Even civilian purposes, nuclear explosion is banned. It follows the principle of everywhere everyone that is it bans nuclear explosion everywhere under the ground underwater atmosphere land everywhere it bans the nuclear explosion everywhere and it is banned for everyone so that is what is this uh, you know uh, treaty talking about this uh, came into four i mean this this was uh, you know um, created in a conference that conference is known as Conference of Disarmament. This conference took place in 1996 in Geneva and it is where this particular nuclear uh, test ban treaty was conceptualized. Okay. Now, this particular uh, nuclear test ban treaty, it has two important articles. One article is Article 9. This Article 9 says that this treaty is for unlimited duration okay the next is article 14 this article is important article 14 is important in this context of why russia signals it will step back from nuclear test treaty the article 14 says if this treaty has to enter 
into force if this treaty has to come into force then it will take 180 days after 180 days after 44 countries in annex 2 44 countries of annex 2 ratify the treaty so the treaty will come into force if 44 countries in annex 2 ratify the treaty what is annex 2 annex 2 is at that 1996 in that period which were all the countries that had nuclear facilities all those countries that had nuclear facilities in 1996 those countries come under the annex 2 and it involved the countries of 44 nations so this is the article 14 okay so you got an article 9 you got to order article 14 so you got to know that 44 nations have to ratify this treaty but up to this point there has been only 36 nations that have ratified this treaty that is one the second is eight states have still not ratified the eight states are one china two north korea three egypt four is iran 5 is Israel, 6 is India, 7 is Pakistan and 8 is USA. That is the contention with respect to Russia but I am coming now. The ratification is still not append amongst these 8 states. The third thing that you should know is if we take India, Pakistan and North Korea, these three nations have not even signed they have not signed this treaty at all okay forget ratification the signing itself is not done when it comes to india and pakistan and north korea now in this context russia tells that it wants to back out from this treaty because it just wants to come on par with usa russia tells that if usa has not signed or not ratified this treaty why should we ratify it and that is the reason that russia wants to back out of this nuclear test ban treaty all right so this is the context of the article that talks about russia signals it will step back from nuclear test treaty however this treaty is important it may come in the prelims exam so please glance over the important provisions i covered it but it is also your responsibility to keep reading on this okay so these were the important issues for the 7th of october i hope it helped i hope i uh, could uh, give you a conceptual understanding of the important issues however keep reading newspapers Please make sure that you like, share and subscribe so that it reaches as many people as possible. The more it reaches, the more I get the motivation and inspiration to keep helping you out. Okay. So thank you guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.